I'm Samuel Temple. I'm Logan Ledman. This month on 1855, we're talking about one of the most notable architects of the 1800s. He designed stunning buildings around the nation and the world. He attended school in Faribault and also set up his architectural practice here. Olaf Hansen was also the first deaf architect in America. Olaf Hansen was born on September 10th, 1862 in Fjellkinj, Sweden. I apologize to my Swedish ancestors for horribly mispronouncing that. By 1873, Olaf had lost hearing in one of his ears, probably due to prolonged exposure from the frigid cold. After his father died in 1874, Olaf's family, led by his brother Hans, traveled to America in 1875, where he grew deaf in both ears and remained that way for the rest of his life. Swedes began emigrating to America following the U.S. Civil War, partially due to consistently poor crop yields. The Hansons came to this country in between large Swedish movements, but for them the move was most likely part of coping with the loss of their father. Young Olaf's tough experience on the American frontier was not easy. In fact, life as a deaf person has been difficult for much of history. The Greeks believed that the deaf could not be educated, and many early religious records indicate that the deaf were considered to be punishments from God. Okay, my name is Jody Olson, and I am, my current title is Educational Coordinator. So we are in our second oldest building on campus. This is called Noise Hall, and the room that we are in is the auditorium, and that is named in honor of Frank Turk. Uh, he is a well-known alumni that graduated from here. Once hearing individuals are educated, they're great. They're wonderful allies with the legislature and related to developing laws and supporting our deaf children. Once they get it, they're wonderful systems of support. But it's when people are not educated or not aware of it, oftentimes that's where that support is lacking. That's where we need to make sure that they understand and that we educate them. And from there on out, we'll have that support from them. Those beliefs began to change in the late 1800s, partially due to the work of societal and political leaders such as Thomas Gallaudet and Laurent Clerc, who together in 1817 formed the American School for the Deaf. Clerc's 41 years at the school had a profound impact on a generation of deaf students and on the formation of American Sign Language. Those changing attitudes towards the deaf in the 1800s was also in part due to the creation of new schools like this one, the Minnesota State Academy for the Deaf. The MSAD enrolled its first students in 1863, and Olaf Hansen joined the ranks of young people who benefited from its education in 1878, when he enrolled at the age of 16. At the academy, he studied history, math, geography, and sign language. He graduated in 1881 and immediately enrolled at Gallaudet University, the world's only liberal arts school for the deaf. Gallaudet University, originally called the National School for the Deaf and Dumb, was revolutionary among deaf schools as it provided its students a wide variety of career opportunities. At Gallaudet, Olaf Hansen had narrowed down his choice occupations to three options engineering, surveying, and architecture. After being told he had little chance in engineering or surveying, but that he could succeed in architecture if he had the skills, Olaf Hansen chose his profession. Besides, besides getting heavily involved in school sports, learning fluent Latin, French, German, on top of studying architecture, Olaf Hansen graduated as valedictorian of his class at Gallaudet in 1886. And he had that attitude where he believed in himself and the other people out there felt that he couldn't be successful because he was deaf. But he didn't allow that to impede him. He proved them wrong. He became successful. He traveled to many different cities. He traveled to Europe. He did work here in Faribault. He designed many different buildings in Faribault as well as the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf. Olaf's potential was immediately seen by a firm in Milwaukee and he was quickly hired as a draftsman. After three years he decided he wanted a continent with a little more life experience. So he traveled to Europe to study architecture. For a little less than a year, he studied at École des Beaux-Arts in Paris. I apologize to my uh, British 
ancestors for horribly mispronouncing that French name. I don't have any French ancestry. And neither did Olaf Hansen, who also spent his time studying the treatment of deaf citizens in Europe, submitting papers about his findings back to Minnesota. Moving forward on his quest to check off as many locations on his passport as possible, he took a job at Philadelphia in 1890, designing the Pennsylvania Institute for the Deaf. Once he wrapped that nine-year project up, he came back here and became a teacher, the Minnesota State Academy for the Deaf. Soon after, he also started his architectural firm in town, which produced 54 buildings, some of which you saw at the beginning of this episode. People thought that he couldn't, he couldn't do anything. He was an architect, he was good at that, but he had to fight harder for it. But that's his characteristic, that's his character, the perseverance, proving to people that he could do it. And he also designed um, the Deaf Club in St. Paul, Thompson Hall. It's still standing today. He designed homes or buildings that were deaf friendly. For example, he made sure that there were a lot of windows to allow the natural light to come in. The stairwells were wider. Back then, stairwells were very narrow. And he made sure to widen them so that way two people could stand next, stand side to side, going up the stairs and continuing their conversation instead of having to be single file. One of the houses that he designed um, in St. Paul, the the Charles Thompson Deaf Club. You know, that's still in use today. The deaf community uses that, and we benefited from it design. So many windows and the stairwells are, you know, wider, as I mentioned. And we have pride in his work here in Faribault. There are some buildings in Faribault, for example, the Beery House. He designed that house. The Noise Home was another one. So there's many buildings within the town that he designed, and we're proud of that. In 1895, Olaf became the first deaf architect to design a building for the college that had given him his life's passion, Gallaudet University, where he designed a dormitory that still stands today. It's worth noting that the 1890s were a time of personal as well as professional success for Olaf. After all, architecture wasn't the only thing he had studied in the city of love. In 1899, he married Agatha Teagle, who just so happened to be the first female graduate of Gallaudet University. So they both had it a huge impact on the deaf community. His wife showed that women can graduate from college. So yes, definitely, they played a huge role um, in impacting the American deaf community. Despite the progress the deaf community was making, social attitudes in the early 1900s presented a challenge to that steady growth. Fifty years after Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species, the eugenics movement began misconstruing Darwin's ideas and taking root in American politics. Eugenics politicized the scientific tenets of natural selection, claiming that human progress necessitated the breeding out of supposed imperfections in humanity. Deafness was one of the qualities proponents of eugenics claimed held the human race back. Even Alexander Graham Bell, the renowned inventor of the telephone, claimed that deaf people should not be allowed to marry and supported the gradual elimination of deaf culture. The deaf community continually spoke out against these claims. Due to the presence of deaf-only schools and a common language, deaf people tended to stick together socially. Their shared experiences led to the formation of communities, all of which knew that society's views on the deaf were unacceptably incorrect. So imagine this is the world, and it's full of hearing people. And this one dot represents the deaf individuals in the world. So it's hard to really educate everyone about deafness and issues related to that, the things that we need. So it's always a struggle every year. Olaf continued being a part of this community as America roared into the 20th century. And after a decade that saw him established as a faithful family man and a prolific architect, he became a profoundly impactful activist for the rights of the deaf. To aid in the fight against a resurgence of anti-deaf rhetoric, Olaf Hansen began taking on more leadership roles, becoming a figure of the deaf community. 
In 1908, he wrote to President Theodore Roosevelt demanding an end to discrimination against deaf employees in the hiring process. A notable passage reads, My greatest obstacle is not my deafness, but to overcome the prejudice and ignorance of those who do not understand what the deaf can do. The main attitude and perspective is that deaf individuals can't do anything. You know, we go through a lot of struggles um, to getting equal access to things, not just in school, but also out in the community. For example, even to this day, people are shocked that I'm married, I have kids. Some people ask me, do you drive a car? Um, maybe about 10 years ago, I went scuba diving and I've had a certification for many years and I went to another country and they told me no because I was deaf. So, you know, we do face a lot of discrimination and that's been a long time. It's, it's been a historical issue, a historical myth that people have thought that if a child learns to sign, it will impair their ability to learn. And oftentimes that's why signing was not allowed or has not been allowed. Uh, currently in the movies, in the theater, if there is a deaf role, oftentimes they hire a hearing actor to, to, to perform that deaf role. Deaf people can perform that role. So that's just one of several examples of that discrimination. You know, it's 2016. It, it shouldn't, you shouldn't expect that, but it still happens. Roosevelt's successor, William Howard Taft, told the Federal Civil Service Commission to remove all discriminatory barriers in the federal employment of deaf workers. Olaf's correspondence caught the attention of the National Association of the Deaf, and from 1910 to 1913, he served as their president. In 1914, he received an honorary Bachelor's of Science degree from his beloved Gallaudet University. He really fought hard to remove the word asylum from the schools for the deaf at that time, that was, in par that was part of their name. So he helped change that attitude. It's been a slow change. We're getting there. And talking about in the past, individuals really thought that deaf people couldn't do anything. But that's changed. The more the people have learned about ASL classes, and they've been offered in many high schools. They're a very popular course as well as throughout the media. That has helped us a great deal. Um, we've had many successful individuals, for example, Niall DeMarco uh, with Dancing with the Stars, uh, America's, America's Next Top Model. He won both of those and that's really opened a lot of doors for many of us. So the more exposure that we have, the attitudes change, the more accepting they are, the more willing they are to interact with us. Mm -hmm. After spending a great deal of time as an administrative leader at the relatively old age of 62, Olaf Hansen felt the absence of spirituality in his life and the need for a spiritual leader in the deaf community. He became a deacon and then a priest for the Episcopal Church. He died on September 8, 1933, at the age of 70. Olaf Hansen passed on as the Great Depression was ravaging the country, as hearing and deaf people alike struggled together for economic survival. Though the years Olaf left during were troubling times for the American people, they revealed what he had fought to demonstrate. Life as a deaf person was not a handicap. The deaf were not disabled or inferior people. Being deaf only meant that you can't hear. Deaf people struggled, yes, but everybody struggles. The deaf could still be intelligent. They could still love. They could still be athletic or influential leaders or form their own community. And again and again and again, they did just that. Olaf Hansen showed a world that considered him unable that deaf people could and will achieve greatness.
Logan and I would like to thank the Minnesota State Academy for the Deaf for letting us film here and Lola Brand for organizing our time here. We'd like to thank the Rice County Historical Society for letting us film on their location and allowing us access to their microfiche. We'd like to thank Sam Dwyer for the music he wrote for this episode and we'll see you next month.